look at what happened in Seattle. They took over a city, a city, a big city, Seattle. It's a chunk of it, a big chunk. Can't happen. That couldn't happen here, I don't think, in the state of Texas, could it? I don't think so. Thank you very much for being here. It's an honor and very uh, important time in our country. A lot of things are happening, and I think when it all ends up, it's going to end up very good for everybody. It's an honor to be at Gateway Church with the Attorney General, our great Attorney General, William Barr. Thank you. And my friend Ben Carson, who's done a fantastic job at HUD, Secretary. And a young star, Jerome Adams, General. Where is Jerome? Jerome. Along with a lot of my friends out in the audience, in fact, a lot of the great political leaders from Texas, I see. Some great, great friends, and I want to thank you all for being here. Faith leaders, members of law enforcement, so important. We want law and order. We have to have a lot of good things, but we have to have law and order. <laughs> Got to have some strength. You have to have strength. You have to do what you have to do. And you look at a Seattle. We just came in. We just see over the screen, and we've been hearing about it. Bill and I were talking about it. The a law and order. Look at what happened in Seattle. They took over a city. A city. A big city. Seattle. It's a chunk of it. A big chunk. Can't happen. That couldn't happen here, I don't think, in the state of Texas, could it? I don't think so. I don't think so. So I want to thank pastors Robert Morris and Steve Dullen. They're great people. Great people with a great reputation, I have to say that. Great reputation. And Gateway Church, the team uh, has been incredible in hosting us. And I'd now like to ask Pastor Morris and Bishop Jackson to lead us in prayer. Thank you. Thank you. Lord, we need you. We need you at this time in our country. And I thank you for our president. I thank you, Lord, for our leaders. I thank you, thank you, thank you. I know in the Bible that when something was emphasized, it was repeated. Holy, holy, holy. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Lord, that we are about to bring tremendous progress to a problem that's been here for a long time. And I thank you for this administration. And Lord, we pray your blessings and your guidance today on this meeting. In Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Father, we thank you so much for what you're doing today. You have revealed so many things that are untoward, even evil. But we ask according to Isaiah 50 verse four, that you would give us the tongue of the learned, that we should know how to speak to the heart of this nation. Give us a word in season to him that's weary and waken us morning by morning, God, that we would hear and speak. We have a great courageous president who's a problem solver. Thank you, Jesus. And let him speak as your mouthpiece and act as your instrument. And we thank you for this time. Amen. 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 Thank you very much, Bishop. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to thank you, Bishop, and thank you very much, Pastor. That's great. And, uh, we're going to be discussing some pretty important things today, I think. It's all important, but the timing of this is very appropriate. This was set up actually a long time ago, but the timing is very appropriate. Um, we are here to listen to community and faith leaders. We're going to be hearing from a lot of the good ones, some of the great ones, but a lot of the good ones, and to present our vision of advancing the cause of justice and freedom. From day one, I've been fighting for the forgotten men and women of America, and I think we've been doing a great job of it. Uh, we've been doing a lot in many other ways, but uh, it gets lost a little bit sometimes. Bishop, you know that. Yeah. It gets lost. We've done so much, and a lot of the things that we've done that we're very proud of gets lost. Like, we got criminal justice reform passed, and uh, they've been trying to do it for many years, and they haven't been able to get it passed. We secured permanent and record-setting funding for HBCUs, that's historically black colleges and universities. Uh, it's all done. 
We created tens of thousands of jobs with Opportunity Zones, uh, Tim Scott, and we had a uh, great senator from South Carolina that many of you know. He came with an idea, and I thought it was a great idea, and we got it done. A lot of people said that could never happen, but nobody thought it would be successful like it is. Tens of thousands of jobs and investment in communities where that money wouldn't go. And we achieved the lowest black unemployment in the history of our country prior to the plague coming in from China. And we'll get it back again soon. It'll happen soon. That'll happen very soon. In recent days, there had been vigorous discussion about how to ensure fairness, equality, and justice for all of our people. Unfortunately, there are some trying to stoke division and to push an extreme agenda, which we won't go for, that will produce only more poverty, more crime, more suffering. This includes radical efforts to defund, dismantle, and disband the police. They want to get rid of the police forces. They actually want to get rid of it. And that's what they do, and that's where they'd go. And you know that, because at the top position, there's not going to be much leadership. There's not much leadership left. Instead, we have to go the opposite way. We must invest more energy and resources in police training and recruiting and community engagement. We have to respect our police. We have to take care of our police. They're protecting us. And if they're allowed to do their job, they'll do a great job. And you always have a bad apple no matter where you go. You have bad apples. And uh, there are not too many of them. And I can tell you, there are not too many of them in the police department. We all know a lot of members of the police. I was listening today, and a friend of mine was on, very important person, said some of the best people he's ever met are policemen, law enforcement people. And they're taking care of people that, in many cases, they never even met before. And at great danger, at great risk, they get shot for no reason whatsoever, other than they're wearing blue. They get knifed. You saw that the other night. It was a horrible thing. But there is no opportunity without safety. In Chicago, 48 people were shot and 18 people were killed in one day, Sunday, May 31st. Think of that. 48 people shot, 18 people killed. You don't hear about it too much. Every child should be able to grow up in a safe community, free from violence and fear. They've taken a lot of the police protection away in Chicago, and they have great, great police in Chicago. I know Chicago very well, but they're not allowed to do what they can do better than anybody. They could do the job very easily. Americans are good and virtuous people. We have to work together to confront bigotry and prejudice wherever they appear. But we'll make no progress and heal no wounds by falsely labeling tens of millions of decent Americans as racist or bigots. We have to get everybody together. We have to be in the same same path, I think, Pastor. If we don't do that, we have, we have problems. And we'll do that. We'll do it. I think we're going to do it very easily. It'll go quickly, and it'll go, it'll go very easily. We have so many different elements of strength in this country. We have such potential in this country. We have the greatest potential. We have the greatest country in the world. But we get off subject. We start thinking about things that don't matter or don't matter much. And the important things we don't even discuss. But we're here to discuss some very important things today. Politicians make false charges, and they're trying to distract from their own failed records. They have some very bad records. And these are usually the ones that cause the problems or can't solve the problems. These are the same politicians who shipped our jobs away and took tremendous advantage of all Americans, but African-American middle class. So much of that wealth and that money and those jobs went to China and other countries. And they get trapped. They get trapped. They get trapped in a government morass. They get trapped in bad government schools. So I'm going to be announcing four steps to build safety and opportunity and dignity. First, we're aggressively pursuing economic development in minority communities. We're doing it very powerfully. We've done it with Opportunity Zones, but we're going to go above that. At the heart of this effort is increasing access to capital for small businesses, and that's with minority owners in black communities. And we're going to get it done, and it should have been done a long time ago. It's been very difficult. Very, very difficult for some people. Been unfairly difficult. Second, we are confronting the health care disparities, including addressing chronic conditions and investing substantial sums in minority serving medical institutions. We have medical institutions in some areas of our country that are 
a disgrace. I was going to say not up to standard. They're much worse than not up to standard. They're a disgrace. Take care of it. Third, we're working to finalize an executive order that will encourage police departments nationwide to meet the most current professional standards for the use of force, including tactics for de-escalation. Also, we'll encourage pilot programs that allow social workers to join certain law enforcement officers so that they work together. We'll take care of our police. We'll take — we're not defunding police. If anything, we're going the other route. We're going to make sure that our police are well-trained, perfectly trained, they have the best equipment. Yeah. Uh, some of the things that we have heard, because I know a lot of the people in the audience and they're professionals and what they do, and they're successful people, and we're hearing things that are not even thinkable. I didn't even hear — I've never even heard of this before. Last week, it was like — it started about a week ago, where I heard they want to close up all police forces. That's what their attack on a very liberal governor in the state of Washington is. We want the police force closed. It's not like they want to sort of bring a little money into something else. They want it actually closed. I'm thinking, what happens late at night when you make that call to 911 and there's nobody there? What do you have? What do you do? Whether you're white, black, or anybody else, I mean, what do you do? You're dialing and there's somebody breaking into a house and it happens to be a violent person. There are violent people around, Pastor. Even you will admit that, right? We want to think the best, but you have some <laughs> Very violent people. And when they're breaking into your house at 12 o'clock in the evening and you're sitting there and you don't have a police force, they're actually think — they're actually talking about not having a police force. Well, that's not happening with us. We're going to have stronger police forces because that's what you need. In Minneapolis, they went through three nights of hell. And then I was insistent on having the National Guard go in and do their work. It was like a miracle. It just — everything stopped. And I'll never forget the scene. It's not supposed to be a beautiful scene, but to me it was, after you watch policemen running out of a police precinct. And it wasn't their fault. They wanted to do what they had to do, but they weren't allowed to do anything. It wasn't really their fault, but they were running down the street. They weren't allowed to do what they're trained to do. And they took over the precinct. They burned it — essentially burned it down. I'm pretty good at construction, I want to tell you. That was almost what we call a complete renovation if you're lucky. And it was a very sad thing. I don't think I've ever seen anything like that. I don't think I've ever seen anything like that. But we are uh, very proud of the fact that I called. I said, I'm sorry, we have to have them go in. And they went in, and it was like a knife-cutting butter right through. Boom. I'll never forget, you saw the scene on that road, wherever it may be, in the city, Minneapolis. They were lined up. Boom. They just walked straight. And, yes, there was some tear gas and probably some other things. And the crowd dispersed, and they went through. By the end of that evening — and it was a short evening — everything was fine, and you didn't hear too much about that location having problems anymore. They went to other locations. And the same thing would happen. As an example, Seattle would be so easy to solve. Would be so easy to solve. We have a governor here of a great state, it's called Texas. He would solve it very easily, as would — as would other of your — as would other of your political leaders, including your lieutenant governor. They would solve it very easily. It's uh, — a lot of it's common sense. I don't even think it's courage. I think it's probably more courageous the other way, because I wouldn't want to be doing it the other way. It's very unsafe. So I just want to tell you that uh, — we're working on a lot of different elements having to do with law, order, safety, comfort, control. But we want safety. We want compassion. We want everything. Uh, what happened two weeks ago was a disgrace when you see that. What happened on numerous occasions over the last two weeks, people were killed. A number of people were killed, and it was very, very terrible and very, very unfair. A number of them were police officers. And it was a very unfair situation. We don't want to see that. And with strength, you wouldn't even have that. They wouldn't be in a position to do the kind of damage that they've done. They've destroyed people. They've destroyed businesses. They've destroyed African-American-owned small businesses that 
Hopefully, they're going to come back. We're providing funding for a lot of small businesses, and hopefully, we'll be able to get everybody online and get funding to be able to open up their stores and their small businesses again. But we're working to finalize an executive order that will encourage police departments nationwide to meet the most current professional standards of force. And that means force, but force with compassion. But if you're going to have to really do a job, if somebody's really bad, you're going to have to do it with real strength, real power. And I said, and people said, oh, I don't know if we like that expression. I said, we have to dominate the streets. You can't let that happen, what happened in New York City, the damage they've done. You have to dominate the streets. And I was criticized for that statement. I made the statements, we have to dominate the street. And they said, oh, that's such a terrible thing. Well, guess what? You know who dominated the streets? People that you don't want to dominate the streets. And look at the damage they did. So uh, I'll stick with that. And I think most of the people in this room, maybe every person in this room will stick with that. And we're doing it with compassion, if you think about it. We're dominating the street with compassion because we're saving lives and we're saving businesses. We're saving families from being wiped out after working hard for 20 and 30 years. I saw the one woman, she worked 35 years building a store and in one night it was totally wiped out. It's terrible. And fourth, we're renewing our call on Congress to finally enact school choice now. School choice is a big deal. Because access to education is the civil rights issue of our time. And I've heard that for the last, I would say, year, but it really is. It's the civil rights issue of our time. When you can have children go to a school where their parents want them to go, and it creates competition, and other schools fight harder because all of a sudden they say, wow, we're losing it. We have to fight harder. It gets better. So many different ways. But there are groups of people against that. You have unions against it. You have others against it. And they're not against it for the right reasons. They're against it for a lot of the wrong reasons. And we're going to get that straight. Now, we've done a lot of it. We've had tremendous success with choice. We had choice in a lot of ways. We also have choice in the military. You know, before I came here, the vets would wait on line, Pastor. They'd be waiting. Uh, you, it wouldn't be acceptable to you. I know it wouldn't be acceptable to the bishop. I know it's going to be acceptable to you. They'd wait for four or five weeks to get on line, a vet, where they were sick. They were feeling badly, and they'd get on line, and they'd, they'd say there's a six-day wait, sir. There's a two-week wait. There's a one-month wait. And you'd have people online that weren't very ill, and they'd be terminally ill before they got to see a doctor, they'd die. And for years and years, they've been trying to get veterans' choice. That means if you can't get to a doctor reasonably quickly, you go outside, you go to a local doctor around where you live, and the government pays the bill. And by the way, it sounds expensive.